Welcome to the Dementia Researcher Podcast, brought to you by the University College London and the NIHR, in association with Alzheimer's Research UK, Alzheimer's Society, Race Against Dementia, and the Alzheimer's Association, supporting early career dementia researchers across the world. Thank you for tuning into the Dementia Researcher Podcast. I'm Dr. Zara Franklin, and it's my pleasure to be hosting this special episode recorded on location from the Alzheimer's Research UK conference in Aberdeen. This is the second of a two-part special, bringing you all the news and highlights from the UK's largest dementia researcher conference, with over 500 researchers joining in person and online. Today, we're going to reflect on the scientific program and talk about some of the great research that's been presented over the past few days. Joining me to share their highlights are Dr. Natalie Connor Robson, Dr. Su Han Wang, and Dr. Stephen Quinn. Hello, everyone. Hello. So um, I'd like to start. So let's go around the table and do some proper introductions. I will start with Natalie. Okay, so I'm Natalie Connor Robson. I'm a an AI UK Research Fellow and UK DRI Emerging Leader. I'm based down at um, Cardiff DRI. Um, um, my work centers on understanding some of the endocytic risk genes and kind of looking at what they do in our cells. So we use a lot of iPSC models, um, make those into neurons, make those into a microglia and try and understand what these genetic changes do to the cells. So yeah, that's me in a nutshell. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and Steve? Yeah, so I, uh, I'm Steve Quinn uh, from the University of York. Uh, I'm also an Alzheimer's Research UK um, Fellow um, and a senior lecturer. At the, at the university and my group uh, specializes in single molecule biophysics so i like to think of myself as a physicist uh, i'm an optical engineer i build microscopes um, we detect single molecules and we're specifically interested in detecting and understanding amyloid and uh, really trying to under, understand and investigate how amyloid clusters together um, and why that could be important in the context of membrane damage um, so our group's quite interdisciplinary. We use uh, a variety of biophysics, chemistry, uh, engineering-based approaches to, to really try and understand the fundamentals of Alzheimer's disease. Amazing, thank you. And uh, to Suhan. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Suhan Wang. I'm also an ARUK uh, research fellow. I'm a senior research fellow uh affiliated with the Center of uh, Clinical Brain Science in University of Edinburgh. And my lab is specialized in understanding the learning and memory process uh, related to the brain mechanisms and really applying to dementia research is to understand the wealth of knowledge that we build from this uh, uh, dissection of the memory process, how it's encoded, it's consolidated, it's retrieval and it's reconsolidation again, that then these process, how they are affected in aging as well as in dementia models and as well as uh, tag along the novel um, discovery of optogenetics in understanding the brain circuits affected in familiar uh, Alzheimer's disease models, as well as how we can tag the memory cells to retrieve and reactivate, can recover the memory function. So just before we get into your highlights, um, I'd like to ask, did any of you present this week? My group, not myself. Okay, cool. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So. Uh, I think it's actually tag along a theme that's probably not such clear as an organized theme as a session, but kind of spread out through different um, um, materials through the conference. For example, probably not everyone flipped through the uh, kind of pamphlet or brochures of a conference, but there's one page dedicated for uh, so-called EDAM trials led uh, from Cambridge. It's about early detection. And so that's obviously from kind of a human uh, research perspective. And for our uh, presentations, poster presentations throughout this conference, is exactly but from a preclinical point of view, in the sense that the classic curve would say that, you know, by the time you see memory impairment, that's already very late stage, that's symptomatic stage, while 
much other, you know, uh, much earlier you can see other kind of biomarker change. However, what's probably less recognized and it's picking up is that there are different cognitive functions that could potentially be affected years before the severe memory impairment. So we're really looking into that. There are subtle so-called kind of um, cognitive functions that's actually affected in a very early stage. And those is not something very appar apparently. Uh, you need certain behavior models or in human, it will be cognitive tests to reveal that subtle change. And those changes can be actually as early as onset of the brain pathology that initially so will be years before the um, symptoms. So our posters show that in two different familial AD mouse models on that perspective. That's amazing. I think um, looking at kind of the, the earlier processes is really important in, in the understanding of of Alzheimer's disease. Um, thank you so much for, for talking about that. Um, so now let's go to the highlights. Um, Steve, would you like to go first? Yeah, I mean, I think overall the conference has just been a great opportunity for scientists to come together, showcase new tools and techniques, showcase emerging highlights, um, and hear from folks with Alzheimer's disease. So one of the, the, the early talks um, from, from Olive, um, who's a supporter of Alzheimer's Research UK and dementia research more generally, um, was really a good reminder that you know, we're all fighting this fight to help people with Alzheimer's disease, be it through treatments, diagnosis, um, therapies. And so I thought her talk at the very start was a really powerful opener to the, to the conference. Um, it was a good reminder for you know what we're all trying to achieve in our dementia related research activities and I think it set the scene for all of the the amazing talks that that subsequently followed um, it, it, you know it's been a great opportunity as I say for scientists to, to come together um, to interact to come up with new ideas to stimulate new collaborations um, to meet other researchers working in similar areas um, and to you know generally try and push the fields forward. Thank you. Um, I completely agree. All of us uh, talk completely set the tone for the conference and just bringing that humanizing our research is something that we need to do quite a lot because it's something that we sometimes, you know, get lost in a signaling pathway and you forget. So, so bringing things really back to perspective is, is wonderful um, in, this, in this conference. Um, so I'll go to Natalie now, um, if you want to talk about your highlights. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of highlights. It's been a really great conference. I think there's been lots of things that, you know, I don't necessarily think about in my own research. So I think one of the, um, one of the sessions that I particularly enjoyed was the Dementia Risk Factors um, session, where there was a lot of environmental risk factors. I mean, I, the work that I do concentrates, concentrates more on the genetics. Um, so I really enjoyed the talk by uh, Louise Kelly from the University of Southampton. So she was looking at the um, the interplay between pollution and dementia and exploring that link and trying to understand, you know, how being exposed to higher levels of pollution can increase your risk of dementia, um, which I thought was really fascinating. So she was talking to us about the animal models that she was using. Um, and yeah, exposing those uh, mice to some of the diesel fumes and then um, being able to collect and harvest the brains afterwards and then really get into looking and seeing what was happening there. Um, so I thought that was really fascinating. And yeah, she was telling us about some very cool techniques where um, they are able to inject some um, dextran into the brain and then they can look at the clearance mechanisms across uh, the blood brain barrier. So yeah, it sounded like a really exciting bit of work that she'd started and it sounded like they were going to be doing some more with some different mouse models, some high fat models, so something that already has some Alzheimer's pathology. So I think it'll be a really exciting thing to hear maybe next year when we're back. Yeah, hopefully. it was. Uh, her talk was fantastic and bringing in like the risk factors, particularly the environment because it's so important to yeah. everybody um, and it's necessary to discuss these things at, at conferences as well and yeah. it's good to see that, that that's kind of coming out and it's becoming more explored yeah, as such. I think it's a thing to, you know, other people can explore in their genetic models, it's also, you know, combining that with some of these environmental uh, factors as well. I think that the reason you come to a conference is to, to learn new science as, yeah, as well. Exactly. And, and for me, that was a completely novel and new piece of science that, that emerged. And the follow-up talk 
which was discussing the impact of noise and how noise pollution could be related to dementia was, was also for me, again, as a single molecule spectroscopist, really new, really new, novel. And I think, as you say, it, it opens up exciting doors Just for more research <laughs> and it makes you think. And, um, you know, if we can evaluate those risk factors, then we can begin to think about how do we minimise them. And if we can minimise them, then perhaps that has a knock-on effect in reducing the number of people who eventually um, become symptomatic. Definitely. Um, and Suhan, what were your highlights of the conference? Right, so um, I think one of the highlights is that really, again, it's not like one particular there are many uh, sessions that contribute to this really interesting kind of a coherent theme that I'm sure uh, Natalie will probably talk about this and uh, Steve, uh, Steve will talk about this EDI session, this uh, um, like di diversity and inclusivity uh, session is that this gender issue uh, in research career development and not just that career development but also even at the basic research side we also talk about the sex difference in preclinical studies and then in today's session it's really interesting and then it, this came up again even with you know, stem cell research is sex a bias factor in that as well yeah it's amazing that people still think it's okay to do studies where yeah, you're only using male mice you know there's a lot of work to disprove that that you know um yeah, the perceived problem with having female mice in studies with their estrocytal has kind of been disproved now, right? So, yeah, yes. I guess time to move on. Exactly. Yeah. I was Definitely. actually educated at that era. So, yeah, I was thinking, yes, if you want a proper control, you know, without that confounding, because at that time that was thought as a confounding factor. So obviously that thinking has changed. Mm -hmm. And then echo that. Of course, I want to cite the study that Tara, uh, Professor Tara Spice Jones mentioned in the session that there has been an uh, eLife uh, paper looking at this uh, sex different male animals, female animals, and whether it's genuine sex or actually there's a deeper reason behind it. It's the trade difference. Potentially, that's something to look out for as well. Yeah, I agree. I think the inclusivity and research culture panel that was done was absolutely fantastic. And I think it was really good that it was given a prime time session within the conference. Um, you know, it's a really important topic to be thinking about, not in just terms of the science, but also, you know, we need to have a more inclusive environment. Um, and it was it was great to see that being discussed, whether that's in terms of kind of, you know, the disparity between female PIs um, but obviously also, of course, people of different ethnicities. And yeah, there was lots of really shocking stats that went around in that. So I, I noted one down. So the UKRI, um, in the last five years of their awards, 71% went to men and only 20 27 to women. So yeah, I thought that was quite stark. There was lots of other stark figures there that maybe you other guys remember too. But yeah, I think it's definitely something that still needs to be addressed. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I mean, highlighting EDI issues at a major national conference um, is A, really important, and B, that conversation needs to be continued. You know, the you know, completely agree, having the platform um, at prime time during the conference to discuss EDI issues is, is, is something that I haven't ever experienced before at any conference I've, I've been to. And, and, you know, you're absolutely right, EDI issues relate to not just the scientists, but the science, and it's really important to discuss all of the issues um, and to come up with strategies to, to mitigate against them. Um, I thought some of the, you know, the, the interesting parts of, of that discussion for me were the use of networks um, that I hadn't been already familiar with. And so now I've been exposed to those networks, um, I can direct our students uh, at the University of York and, and far beyond to, to help to help them in, in their careers. So yeah, I think we need to continue the, the EDI conversation. It's really important um, and we must all do better. Yeah, I guess it's like, it's important to put some solid milestones in place, right? That we can, you know, not just continue the talk, but actually making some progress. So yeah, good to see at the conference. Yeah, I totally agree. It was amazing. And to, to gain some knowledge of, of kind of the, the platforms that are available to people. Um, I wasn't aware of a lot of those things. And I think it's something I'll bring back from the conference that there there are there are things set in place that, that can 
can help people out or you know find a place to talk and and things like that but also we need to keep moving forward with that and that's something i'm really really passionate about actually so it was great to see this at the conference this year measurable deliverables so yes the conversation is important but arguably the actions that arise are even more so um I think talking to others around the conference as well, um, yeah, I think everyone was very pleased to see that that had been given a really, you know, good amount of time. Yeah, definitely. There was so much positive feedback um, about that session. So it was really great. Just for, just from talking to other people around it, um, it just seems to be, seems to have been a really well, what's what's the word? Well taken, I don't know how to, to say this, uh, taken session. So... I'm, I'm really pleased that it happened. Just tag along the same line of a discussion is that I was really impressed with Tommy's uh, initiative with this yeah. uh, black woman in science. Really and fantastic. Yes, it's impressive. So it's not just top down kind of a discussion or some policy, etc. But you see this kind of a, a how do you call it, kind of from um, bottom up. So it's a from the root, there are people actually initiate this in uh, this uh, platforms where there are all kinds of resources with podcasts, events, dates where they set up to meet with data scientists, etc. So different uh, research tools that are probably cross discipline. So then it's really helpful to while that gap is hopefully will be narrowed down in the coming years. But also there are these, you know, activities from, from bottom up to really push that yeah, for I'm really thinking about how to encourage people, you know, right at the kind of school level into thinking, you know, this career is for me. It's something I can see myself doing, right? And I can see others that, you know, look the same as me doing that. Yes. Um, that was also discussed and I think it was really great. Yeah, Black Black uh, Women in Science Network. Go, go check it out. Um, but I think it's also important for folks who um, are not scientists, but who perhaps work in a science institute to also check out that network. So if, if you're an administrator um, working in, in a science facility, um, if you're a technician, um, you know, as well as a researcher or, or, or a potential scientist, go check it out, get, get involved with the network because it, it just sounds like it's, um, it, it's really helping um, promote EDI um, issues throughout not just the UK, but hopefully beyond. Definitely. Um... So, um, would you like to go around the table again, or are there any other highlights anybody would like to comment on? Um, um, yeah, I mean, I had another talk that I really enjoyed. So this was from uh, this morning's session. So from um, Marta Del Campo, who is at uh, the University of Amsterdam, I believe. Um, so really nice talk, really took us through how kind of the process of identifying new biomarkers, which obviously there's a real big need for. Um, so yeah, I thought that was a really fascinating talk. So they were, um, she was discussing how they're doing that with CSF samples um, and how not only just picking out Alzheimer's disease, but actually being able to differentiate, you know, the different types of dementia as well, because obviously that's really important. And especially going forward while we think of treatment strategies that will become ever more important, I think. Um, so yeah, she was taking us through going from kind of the big picture mass spec type of work, then kind of focusing down on particular panels. So I think she was talking about the PRIDE initiative, which is the Protein Identification for Discrimination of Dementias, um, which has a whole load of different um, groups that they're able to look and kind of look between. So it controls people with um, mild cognitive impairment, but positive for amyloid beta pathology, those with Alzheimer's disease, and those importantly with non-Alzheimer's dementia as well, and then being able to identify some particular biomarkers for all those groups. And it sounded like it had been really successful so far. So yeah, I think some of the follow-up work that they were doing with that was going to be trying to do the same in bloods, which would obviously be a lot better for the patients. I can't imagine anyone wants to be able to give a CSF sample. I wouldn't. <laughs> People are very brave. Yeah, I, think the, the, I mean, the, the, the field seems to be moving towards blood-based biomarkers. I think yeah. they're, they're emerging. I think that from what we've seen, um, there's stronger evidence that blood-based biomarkers are on the horizon. Um, there seems to be very strong links between some blood-based biomarkers in the cerebrospinal fluid and links to, to pathology. So I think we can be optimistic that you know a, a simple blood test and hopefully a cheap blood test mm. is uh, is very much on yeah. the on the horizon. And you know if we can democratize testing, we can catch people at the earliest stages of disease. And at that point, 
um, when there's most brain matter to save, then perhaps we've got an opportunity to, to really um, allow those drugs to be even more effective. I thought it was really interesting, actually, so I was just looking back at my notes, some of the things that they had found as biomarkers. It's kind of interesting that they're getting pulled out as well because they're things that we know kind of already in the Alzheimer's field. So things like protein clearance as being a problem, lipid metabolism, these are all kind of things that we look at in the lab as molecular mechanisms. So, yeah, interesting to see the same sort of things are being pulled out as biomarkers. Maybe not that surprising. <laughs> And I saw just along the same line, I saw it's a really well organized session where they look at uh, biomarkers from fluid all the way to functions and uh, started with a proteomics uh, uh, data you mentioned uh, by uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Marta de, uh, Kempo and then followed by a uh, um, professor, um, associate professor uh, Michael uh, Shaw's talk uh, where he nicely put these uh, what he thinks uh, the current status of these different biomarkers, whether it's P tau, uh, or whether it's PET imaging, and how he sees these, you know, in terms of their implementability and how kind of accurate uh, they will be. And also he then add on to not just the um, biomarker, but also functional marker, where tag long they are going to launch a bigger you know, research uh, on adding the digital technology in detecting, you know, different function change. And again, it's echoing this uh, ETA initiative on uh, early detection of new degeneration um, uh, disease. Uh, and I think that's really a kind of nice session bring us through from not just biology, but also the function side as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, could we go, we'll maybe quickly go around the table once more if anybody has any other comments or? Well, we started off with Olive, uh, as I say, fantastic um, talk. Um, and we ended, I think, with a really nice single molecule spectroscopy talk by Juan Varel at the University of, of St. Andrews. And he, and he showcased some really nice um, approaches where you can detect single protein aggregates in solution, um, can track those single protein aggregates as a function of time with a time resolution that uh, is you know, on the millisecond time scale. And he showed, I think really elegantly, that some of those species that are formed um, can not only interact with biological membrane receptors, but can also damage the membrane. And I think that those tools and techniques that were presented open up opportunities for us to interrogate which of the aggregates, if any, are most toxic. And if we can identify which of the aggregates are most toxic, then perhaps we might be in a, a far better position to develop targeted therapeutics. So, so I thought that that single molecule spectroscopy talk, and I'm a little bit biased because I'm a single molecule spectroscopist, <laughs> um, was, was really quite interesting. But the tools and techniques that, are, that were presented, uh, I think are very adaptable to other proteins. Um, so those same tools could be used to, for example, monitor tau, phosphorylated tau, neurofilament light chain. And so we should start to think about how those methodologies can be adapted to quite literally, no pun intended, shed light on uh, the biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease. Yes, and one thing I really enjoy about this conference is we really see research from all different levels because uh, St uh, Stephen, you have a poster on this uh, um, um, single molecule biophysics. I wonder if you want to sh uh, kind of add a little bit more on your discovery. Yeah, well. so as I say, we uh, do a lot of single molecule detection. Um, we develop uh, microscopy and optical based systems to detect single molecules. And, and as part of our, um, our microscopy development, um, we realized that many of the tools and techniques could be used for the detection of biomarkers. So we're very good at, at mobilizing proteins to surfaces and detecting them. And we thought, well, hang on a minute, couldn't those same tools and techniques also be used potentially to discriminate between and detect proteins in the blood? And so we started now to, to develop um, uh, essentially grating-like structures that we call guided mode resonances in order to uh, differentiate and detect proteins and mobilizing onto those structures um, based on a refractive index change that they 
produce at the sensor surface. So it's, it's preliminary data at the moment, but we've got an ability to detect beta amyloids, 42 proteins, immobilizing onto our surface uh, unlabeled proteins with a concentration of about a picogram per, per mil, sorry, a nanogram per, 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 uh, per mil. So that, that's really promising. It, it, it bodes, I think, well for the, the future and the downstream development of, uh, of a blood test. Um, it's early days yet, but um, yeah, our, our single molecule spectroscopy instruments, if you like, have been adapted um, for hopefully downstream clinical implementation. Amazing, thank you. Uh, Natalie, would you like to tell us a bit about your poster? Because uh, Sue's had a job by herself. Yeah, sure. So um, the poster that I had here is exploring. So as I said, we look at different endocytic risk genes and think about endocytic dysfunction in terms of late onset Alzheimer's disease. Um, the reason for that is we know from the genetics there is a cluster of endocytic genes that are continually pulled out. We know that there are some rare coding mutations in some of those genes as well. And the other thing that we know is one of the really early pathological features of Alzheimer's disease. It's not just amyloid beta and tau, but actually we see these enlarged early endosomal structures. Um, so, you know, endocytic dysfunction does seem to be quite important for the disease and it's early, it happens early. So that's really key, right? Because if you can highlight, as you were saying, something that happens early in disease, it's a good um, potential therapeutic avenue. So yeah, so the work that I was looking at on the poster that I had was looking at one of these genes is called PICOM. And it is a, um, it's a protein that's required to bring clathrin and AP2, which is a clathrin adapter protein, to the membrane. So it's, and then initiate the whole cycle of clathrin mediated endocytosis. So it's a pretty key protein, um, but no one's really been looking at it in terms of uh, its function in microglia. Uh, microglia obviously have quite some specialized roles for endocytosis. So a really specialized role is phagocytosis, which is one of the main things they do in you know, being able to clear and keep the environment healthy around them. Um, but also, actually, um, endocytosis is even quite important for things like motility, which people don't always think of. Um, so yeah, so we've been using, we've developed some CRISPR lines um, that are knockouts, and then we've been characterizing those um, by doing the iPSC-derived microglial cultures, and we can do all kinds of assays, so we can do lots of live imaging assays, lots of nice um, biochem assays, and um, some immunocytochemistry as well and so we see all kinds of changes in the endocytic pathway in terms of you know the endocytic uh, the early endosomal size um, and also in terms of being able to carry out plasma mediated endocytosis not surprisingly but also impacts on things like phagocytosis and amyloid beta clearance so that's really exciting um, we've got lots more to do on that but still quite early days and we're also looking in neurons as well to see if there's any cell type vulnerability so yeah so Hopefully I'll tell you more next year. Amazing, thank you. <laughs> okay, so there were also a lot of sessions on microglia. Um, would anybody like to discuss that? Yes, uh, so microglia has been a, a strong theme uh, throughout the conference. And so yesterday we heard about uh, Professor Marco Pins, of course, talk about you know histories of the amazing discovery in his lab and then can be seen in his uh, cell paper. And then so that really bring us through, you know, the various uh, kind of aspects of microglia that has been discovered uh, in his lab. And then we also move on to uh, Sally Cowley's uh, talk. Uh, is a friend or foe? And then maybe initial stage where it's clearance is friend and later on it kind of put all these seating elements that can be foe. And that's, of course, a really simplified summary. And uh, for me, really, the highlight is at the prize giving uh, at the, uh, Dr. Song Yong Hong's talk, mm -hmm. uh, she's from UCL. It's really impressive how she can quickly moving on from, you know, knowing this uh, very important synaptic loss as a very important biomarkers that's really strongly correlated with a, a, a functional content loss in ID and then move on to understanding the role of uh, microglia uh, phagocytosis and com complement activation in that process. And then leading to, you know, how she managed to pull all the resources from UK, Europe, and North America put together toward deeper understanding of the mechanism. And of course, the findings has been shown in her uh, recent publication in Science and Nature Neuroscience. I think that's really impressive work. 
Yeah, I guess just to pick up on another thing that we heard about MicroGet, I mean, for someone like me who does, you know, the IPSC models for MicroGet, um, understanding, you know, how similar they are to the actual MicroGet in the brain is really important, right? So um, there was a talk by Amy Lloyd who was looking at doing deep proteomics across various different microglial models, whether they were in vitro or in vivo, um, whether they were from human or mice, and then also being able to have those in vitro ones and then um, implanting those into the mice and then having a look at the proteome there. And I thought it was really fascinating, all the changes there. Um, so yeah, one of the things that was really striking actually was those that were uh, in vitro had a much uh, bigger protein mass overall, which was quite crazy actually. Um, but also I think, you know, thinking about, you know, the profile in the in vitro microglia as well was much more similar to the disease associated microglia. So I don't know if that's something that comes with the stresses of culturing maybe, um, but I think something to keep in mind and think about. Um, she said that all of her proteomics data would be available soon on the website. So I guess if others are interested in that, that would be a really helpful thing, a really good resource to have. And also beyond the context of Alzheimer's disease, also of implication in uh, vascular dementia, mm -hmm. or actually in stroke, there's a talk currently given by uh, uh, Dr. Joe Fowler from Edinburgh, uh, will be looking into this microglia in stroke as well. Um, so just before we wrap up, um, as you've all made it to a great stage in your careers, and ARUK are really keen to support ECRs and have piloted a cross-network and a mentoring scheme and uh, ECR training and networking opportunities, among other schemes that can be found on their ECR portal. So I was just wondering if I could ask you all to share just one career tip. So I'll start with Suhan. Right. Oh, <laughs> quick firing right. straight at you. Um, right, find a, a, support of network, uh, a network of support whether it's mentor uh, or, uh, you know, from your internal institute or external institute, give you a different perspective. And also very important to understand, you know, um, what support you can get locally from your department or from your center that, you know, help you through a lot of, I mean, research or administration hurdles. And I think that will help the, that was also the life. I think it's really important to have a good mentor. Um, but if I, had, if I was to give you another one, I think is always, you know, always take up any opportunities that you're given to present your work or go and talk to others about your work, right? Really get out there and promote what you're doing and tell people why it's important. Um, I think that's also something that's very good to do. Don't give up. Don't yes. give up. Um, <laughs> if you're writing a fellowship application or a, a paper or another grant application and that paper or grant application gets rejected, don't give up. Use reviewer comments to your advantage. Yep. Take them seriously um, and help use, use them to help you modify your text, modify your grant application, modify your paper and make it even better because the next time you submit it, it's got an even better chance of success. So don't, don't give up. Um, and uh, you know, use as you say opportunities. I think take them, and that also includes uh, if there's any internal pots of money at your university. Um, it might only be for a few hundred pounds worth of consumables. Apply for it. Yep. There's loads of opportunities to get uh, an undergraduate summer student funded. Um, there's many interdisciplinary opportunities to learn new skills. Loads of courses to develop your um, your translational and your professional skills. Um, so yeah, don't give up and go for the opportunities when they arise. Yeah, and I think just another thing to add to that, I guess, is just, you know, if you think you've got an idea, but you're a bit nervous about maybe emailing or talking to someone, just go and do it because the worst that they'll do is maybe ignore your email, which is fine, right? You can always email them again. Yeah, that's completely true. Like as an ECR, um, I've really been thrown into this conference at the deep end, you know, between public outreach, organising, um, doing a podcast. I've never never done this before. Um, and giving a talk and being around my poster, I have met hundreds more people than I ever thought I would. And coming just as a scientist, as an ECR to this day, and having a poster, it's such a contrast. So for my advice, my advice from one ECR to another would be say yes when it comes to conferences 
because that is where you build your network. That's where you meet people. That's where you make the connections and build your confidence, you know, get this introvert outside of you. So that's my little, little snippet from me. (laughs) Thank you. Okay. So uh, that's all we have time for today. Uh, We're all going to rush away and hope the weather doesn't disrupt our trips home. I hope you've enjoyed listening. And if you want to find out more about any of the research we've discussed, head over to the ARUK website and the online portal is open for another 30 days. Thank you to my fabulous guests, Dr. Natalie Connor Robson, Dr. Suhan Wang and Dr. Stephen Quinn. I'm Dr. Zara Franklin and you've been listening to the Dementia Researcher podcast. Thank you. Brought to you by DementiaResearcher.nihr.ac.uk in association with Alzheimer's Research UK, Alzheimer's Society, Race Against Dementia and the Alzheimer's Association, bringing you research, news, career tips and support.